The Letters of a Post-Impressionist by Vincent van Gogh Translated by Anthony Mario Ludovici Section 3 Introductory Essay, Part 3 All his imagination could do, therefore, was to introduce something into his landscapes and studies that made them more than mere transcripts, that constituted them new gifts rather than repetitions, placed in the hand of the grateful public. And this something which he introduced was the step to higher things, which I believe to be the chief characteristic of his final period, the period at the very threshold of which he unfortunately met with his tragic end. But before I proceed, let me explain why I use the adjectives beautiful, excellent, splendid, masterful, in regard to these pictures. I am not in the habit of lavishing epithets of this vague description indiscriminately upon works of art. A vague adjective is a wonderful thing to help lame arguments over styles. It is an indispensable helpmeet when one is not quite clear concerning any particular thing. But in regard to Van Gogh, this is not precisely my position. Not so much for my own sake, then, as for the sake of clarity in these questions, in which difficulties are so often smoothed over with empty phrases, it would seem desirable to explain why I speak of beauty, mastery, excellence, in regard to these pictures of what, in my opinion, may be called Van Gogh's penultimate period, and which all critics, save myself, regard as belonging to his ultimate or post-impressionist period. In the first place, then, let me pronounce this fundamental principle, as far as I personally am concerned, that there is no beauty, no mastery, and no excellence, which cannot in the end be interpreted in the terms of humanity. There is no such thing as beauty, per se, mastery, per se, and excellence, per se. All these qualities can ultimately be traced to man and to man's emotion. And without man, I maintain that such qualities would cease to exist on earth. A beautiful poem is one that can be linked up rapidly or by degrees, consciously or unconsciously, with things which are desirable in humanity, or in a certain kind or part of humanity. The poem that praises pity in rhythmic cadence, for instance, will charm the Christian of the twentieth century. For him, pity is a desirable attribute of the modern human creature, and rhythm is a convincing and commanding art form in which to cast a desirable thought. On the other hand, it would either revolt the pagan or leave him indifferent, while he might regard it as a sacrilegious act to squander such a precious art form as rhyming verses upon so futile a subject. All beauty, then, in the end, is human beauty. All ugliness is human ugliness. No healthy people of the world have ever considered youth, I do not mean infancy, in any manifestation of nature as ugly, because youth is the sure promise of human life and of a multiplication of human life. On the other hand, no healthy people have ever considered ulcers, gangrenous limbs, or decay in any form as beautiful, because ulceration, gangrene, and decay are the end of human life and the reduction of it. It is true that the beautiful consumptive, the love of consumptives, the captivating cripple, are notions which can be found in Bulwer Lytton and George Eliot, not to speak of a host of minor English writers. But then let us remember from what part of the world they hail from the most absurdly sentimental, over-Christianized, and over-Puritanized country on earth, England. But the whole of northwestern Europe is now quite able to vie with England in this sort of nonsense. Otherwise the eugenic society, which ought to be superfluous, would not require to be so active. But all this by the way. The beauty, mastery, and excellence of Van Gogh's penultimate period than in my opinion is twofold. Its content is beautiful, and its form is beautiful. Its content is only just beginning to be beautiful, because we must remember that this is the work of a man who started in a school that scorned content. But is it not written, 
that there is more joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance? And the beauty of his content is that it is turning ever more and more definitely towards humanity. It is true that the importance of the content in general is only creeping into his works, but the little of it that there is is human. No longer negative to man, he begins to introduce human moods into his landscapes, and with human virtues he anthropomorphizes the ground, the trees, the sky, and the distance. There is as much difference between his work now and the work of his impressionistic days as there is between these two descriptions of the rising sun. The yellow sun ascends into a pink and pale yellow sky, which fades away into watery green and finally into pure azure. And rosy-fingered dawn stands tiptoe on yonder hill. He himself writes concerning a certain study. My desire was to paint it in such a way that the spectator must read and sympathize with the thoughts of the signalman, who seems to say, Oh, what a gloomy day it is. And again, in regard to the other study, he writes, While working upon it, I said to myself, Do not put down your palette before your picture seems to partake of the mood of an autumn evening, before it is instinct with mystery and with a certain deep earnestness. See also the passage about Provence on page 109. It is now, too, that he writes to his friend Bernard, I have painted seven studies of corn. Unfortunately, quite against my will, they are only landscapes. And that he feels sympathy with a soldier who prefers a landscape to the sea, because the former is inhabited. This alone is already a sign that he is turning his back on the sentimental and negative love of landscape as landscape, peculiar to the modern English, French, and Germans, inspired by Rousseau and Schiller, that love of landscape in which man or the hand of man is entirely absent. With regard to the beauty of his technique in the pictures of this period, the characteristic I chiefly admire in them is their gradual glorification of color and neglect of values. But why should one admire color more than values? In the first place, it should be remembered that technique is important only as a means of betraying how a man approaches and deals with reality. While all the virtues of a good technique will once more be traceable to human standards and be human virtues. Now the technique which places color above values is admirable for three reasons. First, because inasmuch as its results are simpler and more definite than those of the values technique, it implies a much more masterful grasp of reality. Secondly, since its results betray far less compromise and blended, gray, or democratic harmony than those of the values technique, it implies a much braver and less tolerant attitude towards reality. And thirdly, because its results are so much more luminous and more bright than those of the values technique, it betrays a much greater love of sunshine, a much more hearty, yea-saying, and positive attitude towards life. And these reasons are independent of the fact that the painting of both Greece and Egypt, in their best period, are based entirely upon color and line technique, free from all values and chiaroscuro. Compare Van Gogh's pictures of this period with any of those ridiculously funereal fiascos produced by the Glasgow School within the last twenty-five years, and you will be convinced of the difference between the bright, laughing, gay-saying attitude to life and the dark, gloomy, negative, churlish, puritanical, and in many respects essentially British attitude to life. How sincere and how deep Van Gogh's love of color was at this period may be judged from a note written in August 1887 to his brother. He says, I am at work upon a portrait of our mother, as I could no longer endure the sight of the black photograph. I do not wish to possess black photographs, and yet I certainly wish to have a portrait of our mother. The fact that, occasionally, his whole-hearted devotion to color led him to produce what I cannot help regarding as an absolute failure, 
cannot of course be denied more than once at cologne and amsterdam i was conscious in the presence of some of his pictures of being before a man who was trying to enjoy the glory of fireworks at midday under a brilliant sun and the result was naturally disappointing i cannot however say that i had this feeling often by far the worst examples of such failures although i am sure their fanatical owners do not think so are the cornfield with the reaper belonging to frau kroller the sunflower against a yellow background belonging to frau cohen goschalk bonger and a cornfield in sunshine at the amsterdam museum of modern art and now i am going to express what will perhaps seem to many the most daring of all the views advanced in this essay the view that van gogh towards the end became quite positive not only in his attitude towards life itself but above all in his attitude towards man after much tribulation and the gravest and most depressing doubts he at last realized this fundamental truth that art sound art cannot be an end in itself that art for art's sake is simply the maddest form of individualistic isolation not to use a less sonorous but more drastic term and that art can find its meaning only in life and in its function as a life force the highest art then must be the art that seeks its meaning in the highest form of life what is the highest form of life van gogh replies to this question as emphatically and uncompromisingly as every sane and healthy artist has done in all the sanest and healthiest periods of history he says man now all that he has acquired art forms technique stored experience practiced observation is but a means a formidable equipment which he is deep enough artist enough human enough to wish to lay at the feet of something higher now his storehouse of knowledge becomes an arsenal which he consecrates solemnly to the service of a higher cause and a higher aim than the mere immortalizing of decorative pages of color interesting and strong color schemes and exteriorizations of more or less striking impressions when these things are pursued as ends in themselves as they were by the impressionists and the whistlerites they are the signs of poverty both of instinct and intelligence they are also signs of the fact that the mere craftsman the simple hand workman or the mere mechanic in other words the proletariat of the workshop has been promoted to the rank of artist and that matters of decoration technique and treatment which are fit subjects for carpenters scene painters and illustrators to love and to regard as the end of their mediocre lives have usurped the place of higher and holier aims in about as many years as it takes some painters to learn their palette van gogh had learnt the great and depressing truth at the bottom of all the art of his age the truth that it was bankrupt impoverished democratized and futile divorced from life divorced from man and degraded by the great majority of its votaries art was rapidly becoming the least respected and least respectable of all human functions he realized that art was an expression of life itself that pictorial art was an expression of life's satisfaction at her passions become incarnate all expression is self-revelatory pictorial art then is the self-revelation of life herself looking into her soul and upon her forms it is life pronouncing her judgment on herself alas it is less than that it is a certain kind of life pronouncing its judgment on all life where life is sick and impoverished her voice speaking through the inferior man condemns herself and paints herself bloodless and dreary probably with a sky above depicted in a lurid and mysteriously fascinating fashion calculated to make the earth seem gray and gloomy in comparison where life is sound and exuberant her voice speaking through the sound man extols herself and paints herself in bright brave colors 
which include even bright and brave nuances for pain and the like. The sound, healthy artist, then, once he has attained to proficiency in his metier, a result which, if he be really wise and proud, he will not attempt to accomplish before the public eye as every one is doing at present, naturally looks about him for that higher thing in life to which he can consecrate his power. His passion is to speak of life itself, and life in its highest manifestation, man. But alas, whither on earth must the poor artist turn today in order to find that type which would be worthy of his love and of his pictorial advocacy? Is a hotchpotch, democratic, democratized, hard-working, woman-redded European a subject to inspire such an artist? True, he can turn to the peasant, as many artists and even Van Gogh himself did. At least the peasant is a more fragrant and nobler type than the undersized, hunted rat type of town man, with his wild eyes that can see only the main chance, with his moist fingertips always feeling their way tremblingly into another's hoard, and with his women folk all trying to drown their dissatisfaction with him by an endless round of pleasure and repletion. But surely there is something higher than the peasant, something greater and nobler than the horny-handed son of toil. Gauguin and Van Gogh knew that there was someone nobler than the peasant. But the tragedy of their existence was that they did not know where to find him. Fortunately for himself, Van Gogh died on the very eve of this discovery. Gauguin suffered a more bitter fate than death. He went searching the globe for a nobler type than his fellow continentals, at whose feet he might lay the wonderful powers that nature, study, and meditation had given him. But in doing this he was only doing what the whole of Europe will soon be doing. The parallel is an exact one. The prophecy of the artist will be seen to have been true and Gauguin's search for a better type of humanity is only one proof the more, if such were needed, of the intimate relationship of art to life, of the miraculous regularity with which art is always the first to indicate the direction life is taking. I have shown how, from a negative and futile impressionist, Van Gogh became more and more positive and human in his content, and ever more positive, brave, and masterly in his technique and that this healthy development naturally led him to the only possible goal that lies at the end of the path he had trodden, man himself. In 1886, he writes to Bernard, I want to paint humanity, humanity and again humanity. I love nothing better than this series of bipeds, from the smallest baby in long clothes to Socrates, from the woman with black hair and a white skin, to the one with golden hair and a brick-red sunburnt face. At about the same time he writes to his brother, Oh dear, it seems ever more and more clear to me that mankind is the root of all life. And men are more important than things, and the more I worry myself about pictures, the colder they leave me. But the finest words in all these letters words which at one stroke place Van Gogh far above his contemporaries and his predecessors, at least in aim, are the following. I should like to prepare myself for ten years, by means of studies, for the task of painting one or two figure pictures. In his heart of hearts, however, Van Gogh was desperate. There can be little doubt about that. Not only did he feel that his was not, perhaps, the hand to paint the man with the greatest promise of life. But he was also very doubtful about the very existence of that man. Not only did he ask, but who is going to paint men as Claude Monet painted landscape? He also shared Gauguin's profound contempt of the white man of modern times. Indeed, what is his splendid tribute to Christ as a marvelous artist? a modeler and creator of men, who scorned to immortalize himself in statues, books, or pictures. 
if it is not the half-realized longing that all true artists must feel nowadays for that sublime figure the artist legislator who is able to throw the scum and dross of decadent civilizations back into the crucible of life in order to mould men afresh according to a more healthy and more vigorous measure the actual merits of christianity as a religion do not come into consideration here for van gogh was not a philosopher all he felt was simply that craving which all the world will soon be feeling the craving for the artist legislator which is the direst need of modern times for in order that fresh life and a fresh type can be given to art fresh vigor and a fresh type must first be given to life itself end of section three recording by elizabeth solog bethlehem pennsylvania